Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mervy, and I'm so excited to get to speak to you today. I want to say a special thank you to Richard Hislop for inviting me to speak today. Uh, you know, I am a campus minister in the Boston Church of Christ. I actually work with the campus ministry in the downtown region. But I'm so excited to, to come over here and speak to the central region of the Boston Church. I want to give a special shout out. You know, I, I went to Tufts University as a college student, and I know that the campus ministry over at Tufts here in Central is doing so well, and I'm so excited to hear that. I also want to give a special shout out to the Bragg family. You know, the Braggs are so incredible. They help so much with the teen ministry here. And uh, they are also my hashtag roomies. So it's been great to be living with them over in Belmont. But, you know, we've been doing a series on the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians is such an incredible book. It's such an encouraging and positive book. And, and today we're going to be diving in to the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2. My title today is Grace. It really is amazing. You know, the word amazing and the word grace, they seem to kind of just go together. But I want to ask you, are you amazed by the grace of God? Do you have a sincere appreciation for the grace of God? I've got two points for you guys this morning. My first one is a canvas of darkness. You know, context matters. And I'm a, a millennial, so to illustrate this a little bit, I want to show you a string of memes. Okay, we're going to take a little meme break just to illustrate the idea that context really does matter. So as you just saw there, things can go from trivial to mind-blowing pretty quickly, just depending on the context. Amen? So, so my question here then is, what is the context for God's amazing grace in our lives? That's what Paul talks about here in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. Let's go ahead and read that. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. What is the context for God's amazing grace in our lives. It says here, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Wow. Paul paints a pretty dark picture here. He tells us that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. You were dead. You were dead. This should have been game over. Death is not something that you come back from. It's not, the, it's, it's not just that we were a little lost. It's not just that we were confused or on a journey or we're just struggling a little bit. But no, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. And yes, nobody comes back from death. It's the one thing that we can't come back from except for Jesus. And, and the truth is, for some of us, that's, that's a little easier to see and a little easier to accept than it is for others. 
I think some of us maybe, we, we're so connected with the idea that, man, I, I lived such a terrible life. I was a total heathen, and God has changed me around completely. But maybe for some of us, we can, we can kind of feel like we're not that bad. We can kind of feel like we look around and and, and, and we, we think of ourselves as being better than other people. We know that we don't fall into certain worldly things or we've never done this, we've never done that. That can be the way that some of us feel, but it's so important. It's so important for us to connect with the idea that all of us are sinners who are dead in our transgressions. You know, I remember growing up, going to church multiple times a week. My parents took us to church on, on Sundays, on Wednesdays, various other events. We were so involved. I knew my Bible. I knew Bible stories. And, and as a result, you know, I, I thought of myself as being better. I thought of myself as being better than my friends at school, better than so many people that I would see in the world that I would gladly label as sinners. You know, I would look at my friends in school and see what they were doing, and I would look at my life, and, and yeah, I wasn't falling into the, the drugs and the alcohol. Yeah, I wasn't falling into being sexually promiscuous. I wasn't doing all these things that I saw people doing around me, and yet I had some dark sin in my heart. You know, the Bible says that the acts of the flesh are obvious, that a lot of the worldly sin is obvious. But there's also some sin that lives in our hearts that is so much harder to see. You know, as I'm looking around and judging everybody around me about how they're such heathens and I'm such a good person, I had so much sin in my life. So much sin. I was so proud, so impure, so selfish, so judgmental. All these things were going on and, and I've been seeing more and more clearly over time that I am just as wretched of a sinner as anybody else. And I hope that you can see that too in your own life. You know, Jesus, he warned and he rebuked people like me. The people who knew how to walk the walk and put up appearances, but the people who had deep corruption in their hearts. None of us, none of us are innocent. None of us escape that proclamation of being dead in our transgressions. And you know, there's some who are listening today who maybe that's not even your past tense. Paul is talking to Christians here about their past and what they used to be, but maybe for you that is your present. Maybe there's some listening today who are physically alive, but spiritually dead. Have you really become a disciple of Jesus, like the ones that Paul is talking to here? The ones that Paul is writing to, or, or are you still following the ways of the world? Are you still falling into these patterns of sin and destruction? Let me tell you something that you probably won't hear very often from the pulpit. Sin feels good. It's the truth. Sin feels good. Otherwise, we wouldn't struggle with it. We wouldn't. I mean, it feels good to be able to just speak your mind and cuss somebody out when they do something to offend you. It feels good to, to numb the pain that you feel in life by getting drunk or by getting high. It feels good to, to just use your body in, in sexually promiscuous ways to just hook up with whoever whenever you want. It feels good to put others down just to make yourself feel stronger or better about yourself. Those things really do feel good. And yet, sin always, without exception, always leaves you empty. It hurts you. It hurts others, it damages relationships, it leaves you unfulfilled, and it separates you from God. Sin is not good, even though it may feel that way in the moment. Sin is not good. And this makes me think about the story of the prodigal son. If you're familiar, it's a story in Luke chapter 15 
of, of a man who has two sons, and one of his sons decides that he's going to cash in on his inheritance early, and he's going to go and he's going to blow all his riches in worldly pleasures. This guy goes off, and I don't even know what he was doing, but just wild, lavish living. And eventually, the place where he went, there was a famine in the land. And this famine made his funds dry up. And next thing you know, the story escalates pretty quickly from the point where he's living large to the point where he, he gets to rock bottom, where he's working for some pigs. He's working for this man who owns pigs, and, and he's feeding the pigs, and he's desiring to eat the pig's food. He wants to get down on all fours and, and pig out on the food that the pigs are eating. And he gets to a point where he realizes, what am I doing with my life? Even the servants in my father's household have it better than I do right now. And he goes back humbly to his father, hoping to be accepted again. And the truth is, you may be, I don't know where you are in that story, you may be in the high times. You may be the person who you've cashed out on the inheritance and you're living large and you're enjoying your life of sin. But I want to tell you today that the famine will come. The famine will come at some point. And I want to challenge you, just turn to God now before you have to hit rock bottom. Because he will welcome you with open arms. He wants you back. He wants to accept you. He wants to love you. If you're listening today and you're, you're battling with certain sins, I want to challenge you. Get open about it. Talk to somebody who you trust. Talk to somebody who you feel like you can be honest with. And just share about your life of sin. Share about how you're really doing spiritually. And if there are things that you're aware of that are not going well in your life right now, you need to turn around. You need to repent. Don't get stuck in the deceitfulness of sin. Don't let sin lie to you into, into believing that it's going to take you to a place of fulfillment. Get open and repent. That's what we need to do if we're wrestling with sin in our lives. You know, it says here at the end, in, 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 at the end of verse 3, it says, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's what sin does to us. Because of our sin, we deserve wrath. Wrath is kind of a scary word, isn't it? And, and I think part of why it's so scary is because we tend to think of human wrath when we think about wrath. And human wrath is somebody has wronged you, so you want to hurt them back as much as you possibly can. That's what human wrath looks like. But God's wrath and human wrath are not the same. God's wrath is his righteous judgment against sinful humanity. It's his divine chastisement. It's always deserved when it's given, but it's not always given even when it's deserved. And that is what we do Deserve. I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine that you are on trial for murder. You've killed about 20 people. You're a serial killer and you're on trial for murder. I want you to imagine that you step in and, and your lawyer comes in and he decides, you know, I've, I've got the perfect defense for you. I have the perfect defense for you. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to step in there. And, and he goes in in front of the judge and he says, your honor, I know that my client killed these 20 people, but here's the thing. I have this list here of 200 people who he didn't kill. How, how good of a defense do you think that's going to be? Showing, hey, look, look at all the sin that I didn't commit. Look at all these things that I didn't do. Pat myself on the back. Or, hey, look, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm just, I won't do it again, you know. Those things are not good defenses. Sin is a permanent stain on our lives. We can't just look at sins that we haven't done. We can't just turn to, to, to say, hey, look, sure, I've done this, but I, but I haven't done this. I haven't done that. You know, sin is a permanent stain on our lives, but that's just the context. That's just the context. It's the background 
over which God's amazing grace can shine. And that brings us to my second point, a shining hope. You know, the darker the night, the brighter the stars. And maybe, you know, we live in a city, we live in Boston, and and there's a lot of light pollution. So maybe when you look up at night, you don't see a lot of bright stars, and that's because there's so much light all around you. We don't really get to see the pitch black night and get to see, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to somewhere that just has no light pollution, and you can just sit down late at night and look up and see just how breathtakingly beautiful, how bright those stars shine. When we really understand the context of our sin, we're really able to appreciate the brilliance of God's grace. We can't let the light pollution blind us. Let's keep reading in Ephesians 2. We'll start in verse 4 here. It says, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised uh, raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, And this is not from ourselves. This is not from yourselves. It is the the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Wow. It's such a shining hope that we have here in Jesus. And I want to ask, what are you rich in? It tells us here that God is rich in mercy and love. What are you rich in? Now, I remember the first time that I finally had a full-time job. I had a regular paycheck. I was no longer a broke college student, and it felt so good. I felt rich. I wasn't rich, but I felt rich. I remember buying a car cash. I felt so good about myself. I felt like, man, I'm, I'm on top of the world. I am balling. I have made it. I remember going on a shopping spree and dropping $300 at H&M. $300 will go very far at H&M, by the way. And, and dropping all that money and feeling like, ooh, I, I just have it made. I'm, I'm doing so well in my life. And I would treat friends to food and, and whatever. I, I was buying things for other people. You know, my, my order at McDonald's changed. I wasn't just getting the sandwich. Now I was getting the meal deal. You know, I felt like I was on top of the world. I was rich. I was rich. But of course I wasn't really. You know, I don't know how you've reacted to hopefully getting your stimulus check in the mail. Uh, If there's something exciting you want to do with your stimulus check, why don't you put that in the comments for us? What do you want to do with your stimulus check? That that little boost, feeling, feeling rich. But you know, our God, he is rich in mercy and in grace. And he loves to lavish it on us. God describes himself in in Deuteronomy 34, he describes himself as the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. That's what God says about himself. That is who he is. He is rich in love. And because God is so rich in grace, in mercy, and in love, it brings him great joy to shower those things on us. He loves doing that. And he truly gives his best. And we see that in such a special way in how he gives us Jesus. And how he gives his one and only son. You know, we're given new lives in Christ. We just celebrated that with Easter. And we should continue to celebrate that every day. 
We're given new lives in Christ. Nothing that we can do can ever make us deserving of the gift of the cross. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that it's a guaranteed gift. We do have to accept it. We do have to reach out. And we do have to live gratefully for what God has done for us. God's grace is not just a free pass. Because I think what we can sometimes do is we can trade idolizing sin for idolizing God's blessings and idolizing God's grace. We can turn to those things because at the end of the day, it's still just about us and just about our pleasure. And we have this kind of conditional relationship with God where we, we, we want him to just be good to us and be good to us and be good to us, but there's no part that we really want to play in that. We need to live lives in response to the grace of God. Grateful for it, yes, but the kind of gratitude that leads to a changed life. It talks about here in verse 10. It says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Saying that God has prepared great things for us to do through Christ Jesus. And I want to ask you, are you doing the good works that have been prepared for you to do? How is it going doing the good works that God has prepared for you to do? How are we doing building true intimacy with God? Does your Bible study really transform you? Are you walking with him in a truly intimate way? How are we doing showing others mercy and grace? The society we live in today is just so reactive. It's so divided. We're always at each other's necks. Are we falling into that or are we treating people with mercy and grace? The same mercy and grace that God has poured out on us. How are we doing using our gifts to glorify God? We're not meant to just be spectators in the kingdom of God. We're meant to be participants. God has blessed you in special ways, and he wants you to do those good works with whatever he's blessed you with. How are you doing living that out? How are we doing serving the poor and the needy? I mean, there are so many needs in our world today. There's so many needs. And one thing that's obvious from Jesus' ministry and from his example is that Jesus was not blind to the needs that were around him. He was doing something about what he saw around him. How are you doing being a light to the world around us? Do people see Jesus in your example? When they look at you, do they see a reflection of Jesus? If you were the only person somebody got to see, what would they conclude about the Christian faith? And how are we doing helping others to come to a knowledge of the truth? Do you share your faith with other people? Do you help your friends to see the truth of Scripture? How are you doing with that? God has prepared these incredibly good works for us to do. He wants us to live in response to the amazing grace that we've been given. That shining hope, yes, it is the grace of God, but, but that shining hope is meant to overflow and pour out through us as well. How are we doing living that out? You know, as we close out here, I want to bring us to Christ. Because the hope that we have in Christ, God wants us to take that hope and really be a hope to the world. You know, we should really shine like bright stars in front of a dark canvas. Because when we truly understand just how blessed we are, we ought to be a blessing to the entire world world. God's grace is amazing. God's grace is available to us. 
It's available to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and it truly is amazing. In a moment here, we're going to transition to taking communion. This is a time in our service where we break bread. We take the bread that represents the body of Christ. We drink juice that represents the blood of Christ. And what we're doing in that moment is we are remembering the very thing that purchased for us God's amazing grace. And I hope that as we take communion together, that you can really be reminded not only of of, of how much you've been saved from, from that dark canvas that you're coming from, not only be reminded of what you've been saved from, but also be refreshed in your desire to really do something about it. Be refreshed in your desire to really live grateful for what's been given to you. Let's go to God in prayer for the communion. Father, we are so grateful. We're so grateful, and even more so now, just to even take a moment to stop and look at the dark canvas that exists behind us. Father, to stop and look at just how how, how dark the world around us is and how much we are just sinners, God, in need of a Savior. And Father, when we remember that, it's, it's so much easier to be grateful for the grace that you poured out on us through Christ Jesus. Father, you are so generous. You are so rich in love. You are so rich in grace and mercy. You are so faithful to us. And there's no better representation of that than Jesus on the cross. As we take communion here, I pray that you can just help us remember just how loved we are and to be moved by that love to live differently. We love you. We pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.